Hello everyone, welcome back to our Genesis Bible study. This week as promised, we're going to talk about the prodigal son and the cultural context with it. But we're going to do something a little bit different than what I said last time. Because as I was preparing to talk more about hope, like part two about hope, doing chapter seven of Genesis, God's like, no. I didn't feel his presence when I was making the video, it just did not seem right. And I was like, God, what's the matter? Am I, what's going on? And he's like, I want you to do chapter 8 of Genesis. I want you to go out of order because what's in chapter 8 of Genesis needs to be said first. And I was like, okay. It ended up being that God pointed out to me things about the wind, which I know this sounds really weird. <laughs> we're going to get into it and you'll understand. About the mountains and the fact they were covered by 22 feet of water and how important the 22 feet are, like what they represent. And then we're going to discuss what it means that when God says in Scripture, that he remembers somebody and then a miracle happens. Okay, so it's kind of interesting. And we're going to talk about those three things and tons of scripture along with them. So with that being said, let's get started. Holy Spirit, I ask that you would anoint me to speak everything you want me to speak. And Lord Jesus, I ask that you'd make sure that I don't speak anything else other than what you want me to speak. And I also want to thank you, Lord Jesus, that you speak to us through your word and you have so much compassion for us and when you see us going to a bad place or a desperate place you send your wind you send you get our attention and I want to thank you Lord Jesus for that and I also want to bind right now in Yeshua's name any all shame or condemnation voices or any of their sidekicks I bind and rebuke you right now in Yeshua's name you may not speak you may not blind you may not deafen anybody Lord Jesus I ask you would speak what you need to be spoken to people and show them. And I also bind any perfectionistic spirits because that's not a spirit of God. It's a spirit of the devil. And Lord Jesus, I ask you to show people your love because I believe you want to encounter your people this week. Even though some of these things are hard to hear and I know for me I've had to confront some things that were difficult. You do this out of love, not of hate or judgment. Because those only, hate only comes from Satan. And I thank you Lord Jesus for your mercy and your love. And I want to thank you, Lord Jesus, you opened up your heavens as always over every single home and every single person that's watching this and over me as well. And Yeshua's name, amen. All right, so as promised, we're going to discuss the prodigal son. And so I got this information from a podcast done by Krista Alicia. You know who she is. Um, her podcast is called Get Lit. So if this is something you want to, because she talks about it in more detail in her podcast, if that's something you want to look at, go on ahead. Um, I'm not going to read the story the, of the prodigal son, well, it's technically a parable, but if you want to, it's Luke 15, 11 through 32, okay? So the story starts out with this son talking to his dad, and he's like, I want nothing to do with you. I want my inheritance, and I want to go. I don't want to have anything to do with his family. I am done, okay? And so in Jewish culture... The father would have legal right to stone his son for doing this because they see that as disrespect and the father should never be treated this way. That's how they feel. But the father chose not to do that. He chose to let his son go, which is the first thing I find interesting. Okay. And so when his son goes out, he spends his inheritance on things that are not good for him and soon finds himself without money and starving. So he chooses to go be with the pigs, to roll around in the muck with them be covered by their filth and eat the slop with them, putting things in his body that are not good for him. If you know Jewish culture, you know that it's part of the law that Jews can't eat pigs. That's against the law. As long with many other things they're not supposed to eat, but pigs are one of those things that are considered unclean. And a good Jew, or I should say a good Jew, if you live under the law, they don't eat pig, they don't raise pigs, they want nothing to do with pigs. They probably won't even touch a pig. Okay. And so the fact that he's in with the pigs shows he's in a very low place. It's probably very humiliating. He's brought low from how high he thought he was down to the very bottom. Okay. And so when he's in with the pigs, he's like, you know what? My dad treats his servants really well. I don't deserve to be called his son because of what I've done. But when I, if I go back home, I can ask to be his servant. And he would take care of me. I'd have food, I have clothes, and I'd be taken care of. So he starts going home. Okay. 
And his father sees him from afar and runs out to him. Okay. So interesting thing that I've never thought of is back in that time, men didn't wear pants. That was not a thing. And they didn't wear underwear either. They had these long robes on. So if they wanted to run, they do something that is talked about in scripture is like girding up your loins. Okay. So what they do is they pull the front up of their robe above their waist and they bring the back to the front and they kind of make pants. So when the father runs out to see his son, he exposes himself, like his nakedness, to anybody who is around, but he doesn't care. He's so excited to see his son. So he like he disgraces himself to go run out and meet his son. Okay. And when he meets his son, he hugs him. You remember his son's covered in pig filth, you know, the unclean stuff, the stuff that makes you unclean? He's covered in it, but he hugs him anyway. There's no shaming, there's no blame, there's no yuck. It's just, I love you, I'm so glad you're home. And his son is like, Dad, I don't deserve to be your son. I want to be a servant. And his dad's like, no. He gives him shoes, he gives him a ring, he gives him a robe, and he throws this huge party for him coming back home. Okay? And the cultural context of the shoes are that servants didn't wear shoes. So in a way, he's making him his son. And this is your identity. You're my son. The ring represents power. Because that's what the father used to buy stuff in the marketplace. So not only is he giving his son power and authority, but he's also testing to see how well he's going to spend money in the future. So it's a test to see if his son has truly repented and has a David's heart. David's heart. King David's heart. He also, with this robe, is a robe of righteousness. He's covering him. He's no longer covered in pig filth. I mean, technically, he probably still needs to take a bath. But he, that's not what he's covered with anymore. He's covered with righteousness. So I was sitting with God with this and I'm like, God, what's this about? Like, why, what are you trying to speak to me? And God said, people's pig pens don't bother me. People's lowest points don't bother me. People's pasts don't bother me. Whether it's stuff people have done to them and or what they have done. I'm not disgusted by it. I'm not disgusted by them. I should say, he's not disgusted by them. Okay, and I love this quote by Laura Duncan. It says, what we do matters, but who we are matter. Okay, God sees us from a lens of who we are. And he doesn't say that what we've done is who we are. That's shame. Okay, shame will always have the voice of soul condemnation. You, you will be what you did. You will be what's happened to you. That's always the way it's going to be. It has this hopeless sounding voice. That this is, this is just, you're a victim and you're down and you're ne it's never going to get any better. That's what shame sounds like. That's not God's voice at all. Does that mean there aren't any consequences for our actions? No. Does it mean that God won't test us to see if we've repented like the father did with his son? No. That's not what that's saying at all. But God sees our pig pen moments as a time for he can encounter us and love on us in those places where he can give us a big old hug when we're covered. Because he's not afraid of the uncleanliness. You can even kind of see this with Jesus when he healed the lepers. Because remember, in Jewish culture, the lepers weren't allowed to be in society. They were unclean and were sent out. No one was allowed to touch them. No one was allowed to really talk to them. Like, they were just out. Okay? What did Jesus do before he healed them? He touched them. Okay? So if you can imagine going several years without being touched or talked to or treated like a human, you're treated like a disease. You become a disease. Jesus touched them. He's like, you're mine. You're my child. Okay? He wants to love on us in those places. But after he loves on us, he wants to give us the power and authority. He wants to clothe us in righteousness and give us identity. But that can only happen when we repent and come to him. Maybe repent's not quite the right word. It kind of depends when you bring those places. And I got to say, there are some things that have been done to me that I have done um, that I felt a lot of shame over. And I was terrified of bringing those to God. But I chose to, even like with the little moments that I felt shame for, you know, the little ones, I brought those to God to see, check his response. I was like, Ooh, are you going to, are you going to, you know, gavel me and go, rah, 
you know, with a hammer? Or what are you going to do? And I was met with love and compassion, which healed me. And I encourage you guys. I, I, I beg you guys. If you guys don't have hope about your past, you won't have hope about your future either. You should be living in your past and you will miss the opportunities to live in your purpose and your calling and work with God because you're going to be in your past. I encourage you guys, please bring it to God. Whether it be choices you've made and or things that have been done to you, please come to God and be healed. Be restored and made new. Whether you have leprosy, you've been rolling with the pigs. It doesn't matter. God doesn't see you as leprosy. And he doesn't see you as rolling in the pigs. He sees you for you. Okay? And something else God wanted me to say before we move on is that if you feel like you have nothing to offer God, that you're like this slow, horrible piglet or something, or you're just full of leprosy and you just cannot have, you just don't have anything to offer God. Like parts of you just been falling off. You know, like with leprosy, that's what happens. You just feel like parts of you just been falling off or you just feel like a piglet. I want you to understand something. God loves multiplying things. Okay, if you remember when he fed the 5,000, he took some fish and he took some bread from a boy from his lunch and fed everybody. Okay, so if you feel like you have nothing, just come before God and say, you know what, God, I feel like I have nothing. But I know you're the God of the, you're the multiplier God, you're the provider God. So I give you what I don't have are just two hands that have nothing in them. Please multiply this. And guess what? God will be faithful and he will do it because that's a hobby of his. He loves multiplying things for his children. And I also want to say something else. If you still feel like you have nothing, remember God created the whole world from nothing. And everything in it. He, it's definitely a hobby for him to go, oh, nothing? I'll go make something. So come in with faith and say, you know what, God? You're the God that makes no something out of nothing. I feel like there's nothing here. Just give that to God and God will go, okay, I'm going to make something new. And make a new creation. Okay? So I just want to say that before we move on to chapter 8 of Genesis. So with that being said, let's start... Well, actually, there's a little, little minor lie on my part. We're going to read one verse in chapter 7, and then we're going to read a couple verses in chapter 8. So Genesis chapter 7, verse um, 20... It says, the waters prevailed 15 cubits, which is 22, around 22 feet, or 7 meters, depending on how you see that, upward, and the mountains were covered. So we're going to remember that for later when we're going to talk about mountains and the 22 feet. Okay? Now we're going to go to verse 1 of chapter 8. And it says, then God remembered Noah, key point, and every living thing and all the animals that were with him in the ark. And God made a wind, that's another point, pass over the earth and the waters subsided. Okay? So you remember at this point Noah's been on the ark for five months. Five months. And God remembers Noah and makes the waters recede by sending his wind. Okay? The fountains of the deep and the windows of the heaven were also stopped. So we haven't quite talked about the flood but what this is kind of talking about is the fountains of the deep is it talks about the water coming out from the crust and coming up and then the windows in heaven were, um, God talks about in the beginning of Genesis that he put water or ice, some form of water around the earth. There used to be water above, um, above us to protect us from the sun. We're going to talk about that more next time. I'm not going to talk about that here. Um, that's kind of what that's talking about if you weren't aware of that. Okay, and then the waters receded continu continually from the earth and at the end of the 150 days the waters decreased. Then the ark rested in the seventh month, 17th day of the month, on the mountains of Ararat. And it, and we're going to stop right there. Okay. So the first thing we're going to talk about is God's wind. Because I was like, the wind? The wind made the water recede? Like, I don't understand. And so I was like, God, what is this thing with the wind? Why are you pointing this out to me? And God's like, well, what is wind? And I'm like, well, wind is when a high pressure system goes into a low pressure system and makes wind. God's like... Yes, but you need to do more research on that. What, what's, what's causing this pressure? So I looked at it and it's temperature. So a cold pressure system is a higher pressure than a warmer one. And so it goes from cold air to warm air. Okay. So I'm like, okay, God, what do you mean? And God's like, there's two things with this. Sometimes I send wind 
to, be able to increase pressure on my people, depending on what's going on. And we're going to talk more about that later, so bookmark that. But also, when things get really hot for my people and they're getting miserable, I send a cold, I bring cold air in to cool it off. Okay. So let's talk about this stuff in more detail. Because I was like, okay, God, but what's that? I don't understand. There seems to be a big deal. I'm like, what is this wind? It doesn't seem like regular wind. So I started looking throughout scripture and there's a lot on wind. I had no idea. And I'm, we're not going to cover all of it because um, that'd be, that'd be a long video but there's the four winds which we're going to talk about a little bit there are and within these four winds all the directions of the winds are talked about in the bible okay so like the north and south wind unless you guys know something more about them all i could find in the bible mentioned them sorry what was mentioned with them is mostly weather type stuff so like warm warm moist air comes from the south and then cold air comes from the north like we kind of know that just from know regular science the east and west winds that's a little different especially the east wind there's scorching winds which are like for god's judgment there's winds that break up um boats you know and it just keeps going okay so i want to talk about the east and west winds first okay and what i find interesting is the east wind part of the red sea you know moses put his you know did you know, did what god told him but all night a wind blew and parted the Red Sea and then dried the sand so the Israelites can cross. Isn't that interesting? An east wind is very specific. But one of the one of the things I want to talk about that God really wanted me to talk about was the plague, the locust plague in Egypt. Okay, because the locust came in on the east wind and left on the west wind. The west wind took them out. Okay, which I was like, okay, God, why are you pointing this out to me? Why? What's going on here? And God's like, um, the locusts weren't a plague to the Israelites. And I'm like, what? What do you mean? Locusts eat everything green. Like, they're, that, that's very traumatizing. That's like, eats up a huge amount of food source and nutrition. God's like, it was not a plague for the Israelites. Because the very things they ate were the very things they ended up complaining about in the desert. The leeks and the garlic and everything. They're like, God, why are you letting us starve? The Egyptians gave us food. Like all the leeks and the garlic, we're craving all this stuff. And and God's like, I was trying to show them they didn't need that stuff. They just need me. That this stuff is standing in between me and them. Because like, if you don't know, like the plagues in Egypt are all about attacking the gods of the Egyptians. I believe it is not only to be a witness to the Egyptians, but, but to be a witness to the Israelites that they're all powerful, abusive um, slave owner wasn't really all that powerful and that God is truly God because they've been indoctrinated into the Egyptian gods are all powerful God wanted to get rid of that toxicity so he showed them that and that's why he sent the locusts for them especially I mean it was judgment for the Egyptians of course but he's trying to point out to them that he wants to give them manna and quail that came in on a wind you know we're starting to see a theme here God's wind seems to be everywhere okay but I was sitting with God and I'm like God, do we need locusts in our lives? And what does that look like? And God's like, I want to send my locusts into my people's lives because there are things in, that are in their lives that are standing in between me and them. And if they ho keep holding on to them, their stranglehold and keep loving them, they're going to lose the promised land, just like the Israelites said. They're going to complain and I'm going to honor what they say and they're going to die in their desert clinging to all this stuff that's just going to kill them and separate me from them. And I was like, oh wow. And I'm like, God, but it's so, it's so intimidating because like, figuratively speaking, I like my raspberry bushes. I like my huckleberries and my blackberries and all those things. And if the locusts come in, they're going to eat them and I won't have those anymore. I mean, I understand that some of those things might be, you know, separate me from you, but how do I walk through that? Like, that just sounds so devastating. And God's like, do you remember Job? And I was like, yeah. I'm like, Job had everything taken from him. But at the end of all of that, everything was returned with more. He's like, in the law, it says that when someone takes something from somebody, they has to be returned seven times. He's like, I have full intention of returning everything seven times. But I got to remove that barrier between me and my people. So we can have intimate relationship. They can't depend on things or people or whatever. 
<coughs> they also can't have these belief systems that are keeping me from them. They also can't have all these protectors that they use to protect themselves. I want to cleanse my people. I want them to be about my business. You know, he just keeps listing all these things. Like, I want their security to be found in me. Not in money, not in circumstances, not in anything else. And it, he just kept saying things. And so I want you guys to remember this at the end, because I will do a special prayer at the end for this and several other things. Um, because I'm going to ask God to send the locusts into my life. And for those of you that are interested, I'm going to pray for you. Okay, we're going to talk about if you don't want that or if it's not your season, that's fine. I'll, t I'll show you at that time how to say no thank you. Okay, because if you don't want the locusts, that's fine. Okay, let's talk more about this wind. Okay, let's talk about a scorching wind. Okay, so a scorching wind came from the east and it was sent to Jonah. Okay, so when he was outside Nineveh, most of us know that he was like, okay, God, I preached to them, destroy, destroy. And he was just waiting out in the hot sun. It was like really hot. And then he went underneath a plant to get some shade. And then God sent a scorching wind and the plant withered. Okay. And then he's like, God, the plant. And God's like, you care more about the plant than these people. So what God was telling me about that, he's like, sometimes I send a scorching wind, which adds pressure, we talked about before, to expose the heart and attitudes of my people. I want them to be in alignment with me. And that can only be done with a scorching wind. Okay? And it doesn't always necessarily mean a, a physical scorching wind. But as I kept listening to all these things that God was showing me, I was like, wow. I mean, there's so many more. I mean, I have so many more in my notes. It just keeps going and going. But I was like, God, but what is the wind, though? Because you, when you talk to Elijah, when you do that whirlwind, and that earthquake, you told him, I'm not in the wind. So it's not you, but what is it? And I found that, let me see. I gotta look into my notes here. Um, that, one second. I lost it. Okay, I can't find the specific reference, but it says that the four winds specifically are angels. And that the four wind is designed, four winds, sorry, it's plural. They are designed to um, bring God's people to their callings. Okay. And, and that's something we're going to pray about a little later also. What I'm trying to say is, this is my opinion now. I believe God's wind is a show of his power. Sometimes it's angels, sometimes it's his love, sometimes it's his kindness, sometimes it's a correction of, an, of a parent to a child. I believe he sends his wind to bring miracles with his people. And in some ways, he wants to expose things in our lives that are not doing us any good. Okay? And sometimes it's like quail. He just wants to bring in provision. You know, it just kind of depends on what's going on. But I believe it's his power. Okay? And sometimes it's his judgment. Okay? So let's talk about the next thing. And that is when God remembered Noah and he started making the waters recede. To be honest, I was, I was sitting with this and when I first read that, I was like, God, no offense, but Noah's been on the water for five months and all of a sudden you remembered him? Like, I don't understand. Like, how can you not remember someone when you're omnipresent? Like, you know what's going on. Like, I, I don't understand. And God's like, you need to look up what this word remember means, what it actually means. Because it has nothing to do with, you know, my attitude on the subject. And I'm like, okay. So I look it up. And there's this pastor. Um, and he says that the actual word for when God remembers somebody. It actually has nothing to do with him forgetting. Because he didn't forget. It's that the matter was brought to his attention. Okay. Or he says that the same word is used in Revelation, not the same phrase, when it's talking about Babylon. That God is literally tallying the sins and the whores of Babylon. And when he's done tallying, he does judgment. Okay, it's the same word, it just doesn't show up the same in our Bibles. So I'm like, hmm. So I look at scripture and I'm like, okay, where are all the times God remembers somebody or something's brought to his attention and he's done tallying? Well, it says he remembered Abraham when he brought Lot out of Sodom and Gomorrah. Okay, he remembered Abraham. Okay, 
He says he remembered Rachel and opened up her womb when she was barren. He remembered the Israelites when they were in Egypt. He remembered their covenant of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Okay, and then he went and saved them. He provided Moses. And this is a verse I found very interesting. I didn't. I don't really have that much time to dive into it, but it's Numbers ten nine. And it says, "When you fight an enemy that oppresses you in your own in your own land, the priests sound the trumpets, and God will remember. Meaning, it'll be brought to His attention, and He's gonna do something about it." Okay. Um, remember, God remembered Hannah, and He opened up her womb, and she bore a son. Okay. And I mean, there's so many other verses where it talks about God remembers. Um, Sorry, I'm just reading through all my notes. Where God remembers us. So I'm like, okay, God, what does this mean, though? Like, how do we bring this to your attention? So I'm like, I feel like I talk about things, and is that not bringing things to your attention? And God's like, um, you've complained about it. You've talked to other people about it, but you didn't bring it to my attention. And I was like ouch. So I'm like, so, okay, so how do I bring it to your attention? And he's like, complaining comes from a victim stance. Complaining says that I'm not going to do anything and that I don't care. That's your belief going into it. So I'm going to be like, ew, I want nothing to do with that. Like, that's, that's not me. Okay? And I'm like, okay, that would make sense. Because if someone came up to me like that, I'd be like, oof, that feels gross. Like, sounds like you really don't want my help. Okay. So like, so how do we bring things to your attention? And God's like, you enter my courts with praise. Okay. You lay it down before me, just the facts. And you say, like, if there's things in scripture, like, God, this doesn't line up with scripture. This doesn't seem right. And you lay it at his feet and you ask questions. Okay, you just present the facts and you ask questions. You go, okay, God, so-and-so is doing this. And it doesn't line up with in scripture by what you say about love. What you say, um, you know, and you just list things. And you're like, God, I don't know what to do about this. Is it okay if you do something about this? Like, how, why are they treating me this way? Why, you know, or, or whatever it is. It's like, oh, what about my finances? You know, you say you're the God that provides, you know. What's going on here? Why have things not been provided? Like, why Why am I where I am? Okay? And if you do that, you bring that to his attention. He's going to do something about it. But, it's going to be in his timing. And I know we, we hate hearing that all the time. But I think when we bring it to God's attention, he's going to do something about it. But if we complain in his courts, he's going to be like, so you don't really believe I'm going to be brought this. You just want to sit in this low place. So you're not really bringing it to my attention. You're just wanting to wallow. God's like, okay, fine. Wallow. I'll wait until you're ready to come to me with humility and praise. I think that's... Yes. Um, that's what God told me. He just said that right now. Sorry. Um, he needs to have a humble people that believe that he cares about them. Complaining does not communicate that to God at all. It has a completely different energy altogether, okay? And that's definitely something I need to work on. So when it comes to things that we need desperately for God to meet, we need to come into his courts with praise. We need to remind ourselves who he is and who we are. That we're conquerors, are not victims. Sorry. We can be victims, but we are not to stay in that place, because that's not who we are. We are more than conquerors in Christ, okay? And we bring the issue to him, ask him questions about what he wants, what how he sees the situation so we can get a proper view and say, okay, God, I ask you deal with this however you want to deal with it. And if you want to give me information on how you want me to handle things, if you want me to handle certain aspects and my part in the issue, okay. And God will bring it, it's going to be brought to God's attention and some, a miracle will happen. You can see that all throughout scripture. I mean, Hannah, if you think about it, before God um, remembered her, she was crying in Eli's, um, in the temple where Eli was. And he thought she was drunk. You know, she was, she was grieved, she was crying, she was in a horrible place because her son's, uh, her son, sorry, um, her husband's other wife was giving her grief because she was barren. Okay, and so that's a horrible place to be in. 
God's not saying, oh, get over it. He's like, okay, I hear you. I hear you're in this horrible place. And when she came humbly to God and presented this, God's like, okay, I can open up your womb and you can have a son. And then she ended up having more sons after that and, you know, Samuel and all that other good fun stuff. That's how we need to approach God about these issues. Okay. The last thing we're going to talk about is mountains. And I believe this is one of the, um, one of the huge things for me is, I was sitting with it, and I'm like, God, why are mountains so important? And why is 20, them being covered by 22 feet, why is that such a big deal? Like, I don't understand. I mean, for the ark, it's awesome, because the ark can slide over the mountains, but God's like, no, there's another reason. And so, I'm like, okay. So my like, God, what do you want to talk about with the mountains? And he's like, well, throughout scripture, I put my temple on Mount Zion. Okay, there's one mountain that's mentioned in the Bible. Satan also had his altars and satanic rituals on mountaintops. It talks about how, you know, when um, Israel had godly kings, they destroyed all the altars on high places. And a couple years ago, when I was in college, I went to Greece, which, awesome experience. But all the temples we visited were in high places, like the Parthenian, huge like plateau. Huge. We had to climb up this, well, not climb, we, it's, it was a steep climb to get up there to go look. I think the Temple of Athena was also up there. Like the Temple of Poseidon is on a cliff looking over the Mediterranean Sea. You know, the Temple of Zeus, huge, huge mountains. And our tour guides told us that it took multiple lifetimes of people to build these temples and um, areas. You know, where they did the Olympics and all that other good fun stuff. It took multiple lifetimes and they made things perfect. It took a lot of money, it took a lot of time, and it took a lot of effort. So we're going to keep that in mind for later. Okay. But I'm like, God, I understand what you're saying. I can understand that you'd want to send floodwaters to wash off the mountaintops because of what was going on in the days of Noah. I, I can kind of understand that, but we don't worship on mountaintops anymore. So what do mountains got to deal with us? And God's like, you have a mountaintop in your heart. You have a place where you exalt because humans were made to worship. You worship something. You always worship something. And you can tell what you worship what you exalt by what you spend your money on what you spend your life on what you spend your energy and you know your time just like the Greeks did when they built all those temples to their gods it's the same thing we might not build it on a physical mountain but we build it in our heart okay so I'm like okay why were these cover why did you cover these mountains with 22 cube I mean 22 feet of water 15 cubits 22 feet I mean, it's more than just for the ark. God's like, exactly. You need to look up what the number 11 means. So number 11 means judgment and chaos due to lawlessness. And because there are two 11s, it's a double portion. And if you think about what the flood, and we're going to talk about next time, how traumatic the flood was and what it did to the earth. We're going to talk about that next time. It makes a lot of sense. Okay. And I'm like, my God, I still don't understand. And God's like, okay. Do you remember the story when Moses is on a mountain, Mount Nebo, with me, and I show him the promised land before he dies and I bury him? And I'm like, yes. He's like, okay, so I can be on a mountain with you. And remember, Satan can be on a mountain with you too. Because Satan took Jesus up on a mountain when he was tempting him and saying, here are the kingdoms of the world, bow down and worship me and you can have them, right? So Satan can be on a mountain with you, and so can God. When God's on your mountain, miracles happen. So if we want to talk about Mount Ararat, that's in the Bible. Big deal. God's presence was on that mountain, and Moses decided to pursue God's presence, and he got to see God's back, which back then, wow, that's a huge honor. You know, Mount Ararat. Oh, sorry, sorry, Mount Sinai. I'm sorry, that was wrong. Mount Ararat, we all know that's where God put the ark. Resting place for the ark, so not tossed around on the seas anymore. He took compassion on Noah being tossed around for so long. Okay. You have the Mount of Olives. Okay. You have the place where Jesus sweated tears. That was on a mountain. The Mount of Transfiguration. Okay. You kind of seeing a theme? Like, oh, I forgot what the I think it was Mount Moriah. I could be wrong. But the mountain where Abraham was going to sacrifice a son, but God provided a miracle, the sheep, the ewe, so he could sacrifice the sheep instead of his son. Okay, so what am I getting at? When God's on your mountain, miracles happen. Sometimes you'll ask you to sacrifice things and then provide 
something for you, like he did with Abraham. On when God's on your mountain, you will see him and grow in relationship with him, just like Moses. You will see the promised land with God. So what happens when Satan's on our mountain? Okay, when we exalt Satan and his kingdom. It'll bring about judgment and chaos due to lawlessness, just like the people in Noah's day. Okay, and something God told me very clearly is like, my, some of my people have made deals with the devil. And I'm like, what? He's like, they've traded their peace for comfort. They've traded their, um, they've traded their joy for money. They've traded purity for a good time. That's all only temporary, and then they're left with the aftermath. He's like, my people have made deals with the devil, and I want to break them. I want to wipe their mountaintops clean. I want to cleanse them of what's been going on in their mountaintops. And I'm like, okay. And God's like, I also want to talk about secret places. Because if you're on the ground, and you look at a mountain, you can't see what's on top of the mountain. But when you're on a mountain, you can see... A whole bunch of things. He's like, there's some things that happen on mountaintops that are secret. He's like, I want to expose the secret places in my people's hearts. The things that shame and condemnation and all these demonic forces are keeping them bound. He's like, I want to expose that and give them freedom. I want them to come to me and seek refuge. I want to cleanse these places so that, so that these places no longer control them. And I was like, Oh my goodness. And God's like, the cleansing is coming. He's like, I would prefer that my people repented. And had David's heart about these things. I want to say this, though. God's not looking for perfection. God is not looking for perfection. Never. He's looking for a heart of David. If you come to him and say, God, I have a porn addiction. God, I struggle with same-sex attraction. God, I struggle with lying. God, I struggle with this, that, and the other thing. I struggle with pride. I struggle with loving my neighbor because they are just driving me nuts. You know, I, I struggle with seeing you in the midst of this storm. Okay? I struggle with hope. I struggle with faith. I struggle, 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 struggle. God's like, awesome. We can do something with this. But I want to encourage you guys. There's a heart issue with anything, whether it be a porn addiction, or lying, or pride, it doesn't matter. There's a heart issue. There's a reason you're choosing into this. I know we talked about this in other videos, and if you want to watch the other videos to get more in-depth detail, that's fine. But there's a reason. There's pain, an unmet need, you're trying to protect yourself. There's, there's a reason you're choosing into this. And if you just go, God, I have whatever the thing is, and you don't go into the deep root, and start working on those things, it'll come back with a vengeance on top of your mountain. But you're not dealing with the root cause. You're, you're still a foundation there, beckoning for it to come back. So, if you figure out, if you talk with God and have him help show you why you're choosing into this, because it is a choice, sin is always a choice, even when it doesn't feel like a choice, it's a choice. Okay? So if you, if he, God helps you, Figure out what's going on. Then it can be eradicated from your mountain. Okay? And when God sees you going after that, because there's times you're going to stumble, and that's okay. Remember, God says, what you do mat like what, what Laura Duncan said, like what I said before, what you do matters, but who you are matters more. If your heart and you're working on your heart and what's the foundations on your heart on your mountaintop, if you're getting rid of those foundations, you're taking a jackhammer to them or you're taking a sledgehammer and you're just totally destroying and demolishing them, that's more important than the occasional time that you accidentally leave a foundation, so to speak. It comes back for a little bit like, no, I don't want you, go! Okay, because it takes time to rewire our brains and our subconscious. And I'm going to say one more thing. Because rewiring your subconscious, that might sound like a daunting task. But the main thing is this. You want to change your identity statements. That's the first part. So if you're saying, I am worth, unworthy, I am never going to get this right. God hates me. Like, I, I watched porn again and God hates me. Or, I 
I lied. So that's one of the abominations. God hates me. You know, and you just keep doing that. That's telling your subconscious that's all you'll ever be. Which is not what it is. Is we are never what we do. Shame says that. That's not what God says about us. God says we're a new creation. Okay? So instead, don't eradicate that and go, no. That's, that's, no. I don't believe that. No. And instead say, I am a new creation. I am made new. And the times when you do fail, that means that that need or that pain or that protector or whatever it is is coming up again. Sorry. I just, I feel like I have to say that. And if you get that need met in a healthy way, if you bring it to God and have him meet it, if you work through that protector and go through another layer of healing, the power that Satan has to push those buttons in your life and try to build on that foundation on your mountain, it kicks him out. He's no longer allowed on your mountain. Okay. I'm sorry. I don't remember what I was talking about before, but I feel like I needed to say that because our mistakes just show where there needs to be more work. And so, anyway, sorry, repro reprogramming your subconscious. So, I, I just remembered what I was talking about. Sorry. <laughs> um, when you're reprogramming your subconscious, instead of saying, I am not a sinner, you say, no, I am righteous. Because your, your subconscious doesn't know no, it doesn't know not. So, all it hears when it says, I am not a sinner, is, I am a sinner. Okay? So, whenever you're saying things to your brain or affirmations, say, I am righteous. I am made new. I am a conqueror in Christ. I am a precious son or daughter of God. You know, saying those things will over time reprogram your subconscious. And you will notice, like I've, I've started doing that in my life. Because I believed that I was doomed to be in a job I hated. Okay, it was a belief I got actually from childhood. Which is actually interesting. I didn't believe I was worth a good job. I didn't believe I was worth God's provision. That I would have live in poverty or poverty for the rest of my life. Okay, and I always be going paycheck to paycheck. And then all these things. Okay. And so when I watched a video by Stephen Wendy Backlund, we talked about them last time, if you remember, um, they said very specifically that you receive what you believe you are worth. And you can see that in scripture because it says when a man, man or woman believes, so is he or she. Okay, so if you believe you're not worthy of these things, you're not worthy of God's grace, and you don't receive it. It's not because God's not going to give it to you if you believe it. It's just your brain will literally, when it believes something, it'll go do everything it can to prove that that's right. So even if God gives you grace, you won't see it as grace. If you don't believe that you're worthy of good friends, everyone's just going to abandon you. Your brain's only going to pick out every little thing of when people abandon you or abandon you, like actually abandon you. You're always going to interpret things as people abandoning you, or they're about to abandon you, or they're about to reject you. That's what your brain sees. And the people that don't, that God sends into your life to love on you and show his love and everything else, you won't see. Okay? So that's kind of how that works. So you got to believe you are worth those things. Okay? And so when I started working on myself, I was like, you know what? This hopelessness thing, that doesn't line up with what God says in Jeremiah. It says his plans are for my good. Being in a job that I hate and that's hurting me and, you know, that's not right. That doesn't line up with scripture. And so, I was like, I renounce that. I am worth a job that God has called me to. A job that brings me life, not death. God never said he's going to stick me in something that brings me death. That's not what he says at all. And he never said that I am destined to be poor. And besides, he's my daddy. You know, he has a whole streets paved in gold. The guy is loaded. He never said that my I was not going to get an inheritance. Does that mean I'm going to be a gazillionaire? No. But I started believing, I'm like, you know what? I'm worthy of financial freedom. I'm worthy of God's provision. And since God's done laying on my heart to adopt children, I was like, God, if you want me to adopt children, you need to help me get a higher income. Because right now, that's difficult. Guess what? Got a new job. Okay, one I've been wanting for a while and I'm enjoying it. You know, and it's just, it's amazing. You receive what you are worth. Okay, I'm going to end it right there. But I know I said a lot this week. Um, God was really heavy on my heart about these things. But I want to do some prayers at the end. Um, and 
this is where I'm going to tell you, like, whether it be something I pray over you or a prophetic word from somebody else or someone else prays over you and you're like, ooh, Holy Spirit just goes, nope, or you honestly don't want it, which if you don't want what I'm going to pray over you right now, that's okay. There's no shame. Or if God tells you that's not your season, I'll do that for you in the right season. Because sometimes we're in seasons in our life and, you know, asking for something in the wrong season doesn't always go well. So I'm going to pray about some things. And the first thing I'm going to pray is that God sends the locusts in. Okay, I'm going to ask it in my life, and I'm going to ask it for anybody else that comes in agreement. So if you want, after I pray, if you don't want it, so after the video, you just pause, pause the video, and go, okay, I renounce what she says. I don't, locusts are not going to come into my life. I renounce it in Jesus' name. That's not going to happen. I do not come in agreement or alignment with that. And that's all you have to say, and the locusts won't come into your life. Or, if God tells you it's the wrong season, say, I command in Yeshua's name that these locusts come in the, into the right season. I am not in this season. Lord Jesus, can you please make it happen in the right season? Okay, that's all you got to do. And that's with the locust prayer and other things I'm going to pray. Okay? Lord Jesus, I want to thank you, Lord Jesus, for your love and your mercy and that you care about it so much that you're willing to love on us so much and just confront the things in our lives that can be difficult for us to hear but you ultimately want our freedom and I thank you Lord Jesus that you're not the God of shame and you're not the God of condemnation those all come from Satan and I thank you Lord Jesus that you love us enough to hug us in our pig pens that you love us enough to touch us in our leprosy and we feel like we're falling apart you're like I'm going to make you whole and I thank you Lord Jesus for your wind I thank you Lord Jesus that you do send scorching winds because sometimes, as much as I don't really like the scorching wind, it shows me things in my life that are bringing disaster. And I think there's you, you love me enough to send that wind to expose those things. I also want to thank you, Lord Jesus, that you remember me. And that when I bring things to you in a way that is not complaining, I thank you, Lord Jesus, that you love me so much that so you go, okay, I'm going to take care of this for my daughter. I also want to thank you, Lord Jesus, that you're cleansing our mountaintops before the floodwaters come. I thank you, Lord Jesus, that when you're on our mountains, that number one, miracles happen. We grow in closer relationship with you and we see great wonders in your presence. And I thank you, Lord Jesus, that with you on our mountains, we won't experience the judgment and chaos that comes when Satan's on our mountains. And I thank you, Lord Jesus, for that. But Lord Jesus, I want to ask for some things. I ask, Lord Jesus, that for everybody that comes into agreement, and for me as well, that you would send locusts in our lives to eat everything that stands between us and you. And some of us, Lord Jesus, and I think I'm one of those people, maybe one leaf at a time, or one branch at a time, not the whole raspberry bush, not the whole huckleberry bush, maybe just one leaf at a time, because that can be so, so overwhelming. Lord Jesus, there might be some of us that grieve these things like, like we would a loved one. Lord Jesus, as you help us through the grieving process and remind us that when we are in right relationship with you, none of this stuffing is in the way between, um, or insulation, that's a better way of putting it. This insulation is between you and us, that you will return seven times what you took away. And I thank you, Lord Jesus, for that. I want to ask, Lord Jesus, that you would send the four winds to, in our lives, that you would send your angels to help us walk in our purpose and our destinies and lord jesus i ask you send scorching winds where you need them sent i want to thank you lord jesus that you're sending east and west winds and if you send north and south winds i didn't see much of that in scripture but whatever you need if you need to break up our ships when we're trying to go to Tarsh tarshish i think you just you change direction by breaking sending winds to break up our ships but lord jesus the winds that satan sends that Royal, uh, make the waters roar in our lives. I think either is you show, showing us the difference so we can rebuke them and say, no, not here. This is not for me. You're not going to break up my boat. Only God can break up my boat and stop my journey. You cannot. I thank you, Lord Jesus, that with our mountains, that you're showing us those places where there's altars that are gross. They're giving places where Satan can bring chaos, or it gives Satan legal right to bring judgment and chaos into our lives. Lord Jesus, we don't want this. We want you on our mountains, but Lord Jesus, you show us those places, those altars, where we have resurrected to Satan. And Lord Jesus, if we have made any deals with Satan to 
try and protect ourselves or trying to make ourselves feel more secure or safe or whatever it is by worldly standards. I ask you show us these covenants. And Lord Jesus, I ask that you would break them in Jesus' name. Everyone who comes into agreement with that, just say you come into agreement. Lord Jesus, we want to break these covenants and these deals with the devil because they only bring about judgment and chaos. And we don't want, like the days of Noah, those people to drown in this flood in a double portion of the judgment and chaos. That's not what we want. And Lord Jesus, I also... Oh, what was the last thing, Lord Jesus? Oh, yes. Lord Jesus, I want to bring before you whatever's going on in the people's lives, whether good or bad, the, more, more likely the bad stuff. I want to bring them to your attention. And even for me, Lord Jesus, we want to thank you, Lord Jesus, that you're an awesome creator and that you are who you say you are. For Lord Jesus, just like with Ezekiel when he had that vision about the dry bones. Sometimes we feel like we're in a we're in a um, a very dry place where the bones are just dry but you say you're going to bring your four winds when you said you brought your four winds into those bones so they can move around and become an army your army Lord Jesus I ask you to breathe life into us of hope that you do care and that you do love us and that we don't have to be victims any longer Lord Jesus I ask that you I, I want to bring to you your attention whatever's going on. And you know what's going on in my life, and we're going to do that more private. But as you bring to your attention what's going on in these people's lives. Lord Jesus, I understand that sometimes it's not the right timing, but Lord Jesus, I ask for those that it's not the right timing for you to do a miracle right this second, that you show them that you love and care about them. You do little things, whatever the little things that they need, so they know that you, that has been brought to your attention. And I thank you, Lord Jesus, for everything. In Yeshua's name, amen.